Uh, but one of the pleasures of coming here uh, is that uh, my colleague Steve Carpenter is here, Buzz Brock is here, people that have been involved in the thing that's been cheeriest in my life over the last couple of decades, and that is the interaction of ecologists and economists, which shows that the social sciences and the natural sciences can actually get together and try and do something about the world. Of course, we failed like everybody else, but we're still trying. Uh, one of the things that, that amazes me uh, is what, what we have a very large number of environmental science departments. We have, I think, something like seven or 800 members of this society now. And the politicians and general public are just as pig ignorant about what's going on in the environment as they were 30 years ago. I mean, we are truly failures, and I'm not sure why. I keep trying to think of why. Uh, but actually, my, my main answer is that the information we try and put out is brilliantly and beautifully countered by the disinformation that other people put out. For example, I discovered in my heart today that the Society of Ent Environmental Journalists, which I've been a member of for some years, I was a correspondent for NBC News, now has Greg Easterbrook on its board of, you know, whoever's at the very top. Greg Easterbrook had written the worst environmental book ever written until Lomborg came along four or five years later and topped him. But the disinformation campaign uh, has been amazingly, uh, amazingly effective just as the same campaign by the right wing has removed from the United States having a sensible opposition. We don't really have a sensible center, but we don't even have a sensible opposition now. When Rush Limbaugh is the intellect on the other side, you know you're in deep trouble. We do need, uh, uh, actually, opposition to uh, uh, the, the left in our country because that gives us a nice balance, but we don't have it. We have an idiot left and an imbecile right, and things are in deep trouble. And what... Yeah, I gotta have dinner with Harry Reid on Monday night. Somebody can call me up afterwards and tell me what the hell I should say to him. Uh, the, uh, I mean, it's true, Obama's a million times better than George Bush, but we needed somebody a trillion times better than George Bush, and I don't know how we're gonna get there. Anyway, uh, what I'm gonna talk about here is something I think all of us are involved in already, uh, but have to solve, uh, and that's something that I call the culture gap, and uh, it's, it's just this, when I was a kid, I lived with the Inuit, uh, and I had a fantastic three months, learned their language and so on. And one of the things that's always stuck with me from them is that every member of their society was basically the pos possessor of the entire culture, and I just define culture very simply as the non-genetic information. That, by the way, I'm gonna set the, set the bezel on my watch because Monty said I can't talk for more than two hours and I don't wanna run over. Uh, the, uh, if the men knew how to use the ulu, the woman's knife, they didn't do it very much, but they knew how to use it. And a woman knew how to squat for four hours motionless over a seal hole uh, in the ice waiting to spear a seal. They didn't do it very often, but they knew how to do it. But the entire culture was in the possession of all the people, basically. There may have been a shaman who knew a special incantation or something, but basically uh, the culture was had by everybody. I'm standing in front of a very well-educated audience. It's probably half of you have advanced degrees or more. Uh, and yet, for example, if we were sitting around in a bar and somebody dumped in front of us, say 10 of us, a pile of parts that they had dissected out of an Apple computer, a desktop, say, who could put it together? Probably no one. If I took 20 random people from this audience, I'll bet there isn't anybody here uh, that in that group, in that sample, that could put together a computer from its parts let alone tell you the provenance of each part. That is, what's in it, where it was, you know, where the metals were won from, where the plastics came from, and so on and so forth. Uh, there's not a person in this room that possesses one billionth of the total cultural information of our society. That's a fantastic change that started at the time of the agricultural revolution, but really accelerated only in the past, I'll say the past century, and particularly in the past few decades. And that is a terrible problem for us. And we're obviously not gonna close that culture gap. We can't all know everything. We can't all know, for instance, what data have been downloaded from a satellite into a certain computer where probably no human beings ever looked at it, but as part of our cultural information. But there are certain very basic things that we have to close in the culture gap. That is, the problem for environmental scientists, for human beings, in fact, for social sciences, is to close the culture gap on a whole series of really critical issues. What are they? Well, the social sciences and the environmental justice area 
Uh, you have to explain to people that Nobel laureate at Stanford, whose name I can never remember, uh, who said that people are color-coded for quality, was out of his mind. Uh, that, in fact, skin color has nothing whatever to do uh, with the quality of an individual. It has a lot to do with various parts of their metabolism and their relationship to the sun. Everybody in this room had ancestors who were very dark-skinned uh, a, just a few hundred thousand years ago, excuse me, not even a few hundred thousand years ago, about 45,000 years ago. And skin colors have changed continuously uh, through, uh, through time since we left Africa in the various shades. And yet, curiously enough, you may not believe this, but skin color was actually an issue in the last election here. Uh, not in here, but the United States. So uh, we got to explain that sort of thing. But how many of your colleagues, say, in the humanities could give you uh, a rational discussion of the difference between ozone depletion and climate disruption, why we should be worried about climate disruption, what an ecosystem service is, uh, why they should know something about the second law of thermodynamics, why they should know something about demography. I mean, here we are in a society uh, where we have mass media. I'll bet you've never heard in the mass media any discussion of the very obvious and tight connection between population size and climate disruption. I haven't heard a single thing about it in the mass media. Uh, what's the best thing done uh, publicly on the climate? Well, the best thing done publicly on the climate was probably Al Gore's movie. Al Gore's movie, A uh, uh, Inconvenient Truth. Well, it was a good movie till the very end. And then the very inconvenient truth about the list of, of cures that came up uh, afterwards. You may remember there was, I think hopefully most of you saw it, there was a crawler there wasn't a single significant cure mentioned. In other words, you got the impression that if you took a little bit of air out of your car's tires, or maybe even drove a Prius, or recycled, that the problem would be solved. It's, a, it's what I like to call a brick in the toilet tank solution. In California, whenever there's a drought, everybody starts yelling over the uh, radio and so on TV, put a brick in your toilet tank, help solve this problem. Well, it does get people involved, uh, but, Maybe even, you know, or even don't flush it so often. But then when you look at the numbers, and it turns out 95% of the water in California uh, goes to industry, agriculture first, about 90%, maybe another 5% to industry. The 5% for household use, half of that goes on your lawn. Uh, another uh, quarter of it goes into your shower and, your, uh, and so on. And maybe a tenth of the 5% goes into your toilet, and you're saving a third of that. Uh, so, you know, and not likely to cure the drought, but that's exactly the kind of incremental crap that everybody is told to do without any real discussion of what the drivers are of our environmental problems. Uh, and I, one of the things that I... <laughs> thanks. Getting worked up, so I got to have some gin. And the question is, can I get it open with my carpal tunnel syndrome? Ah, yes, I can. Uh, so what I'd like to do is run down some of the major things that we all work with and discuss, uh, and hopefully uh, maybe give you some ideas that'll be helpful to you. And by the way, I understand that a lot of you probably teach in institutions that watch very closely where you teach. I can be outrageous because I'm an elderly curmudgeon, uh, but I, that doesn't mean you gotta try and imitate me and get fired. <laughs> let's, let's go first to climate change. Uh, because that is the one thing that has really attracted the media. In, in 2004, we had a press conference in the, uh, uh, in the National Press Club, and it was trying to get the environment back into the election. You may recall that election. I, I hate to start bad memories, but anyway, uh, every single question on the environment was on climate change. And in my view, climate change is, faces us with absolutely horrendous possibilities or even likelihoods, but it may be far from the worst of the environmental problems we face, the other ones that are ignored, and I'll come back to that. But let's talk about climate change. If you ask the average student, or in fact, probably in most universities, certainly at Stanford, the average faculty member, what the most, you know, what, what's the really serious problem likely to be caused by uh, climate change, first of all, they think, Warming is the thing that some places are going to get warmer and some places are going to get a lot warmer. And sea level rise. Well, now, it is legitimate. Sea level rise is the most certain thing if the climate warms, even if there weren't any glaciers uh, or ice caps to melt. And sea level rise could lead to tens of millions of 
refugees. It could lead to this, it will, will lead to the salinization of coastal aquifers. Uh, there's going to be huge problems with ports, all that sort of thing. Perfectly true, all trivial compared to what the most serious things about climate change are. Not even the spread of diseases. The thing that's the most crucial thing about climate change is that our agriculture is absolutely dependent on the distribution of precipitation and what happens to it in the winter. Uh, and if you believe the climatologists, and I tend to because I know a lot of them, and I know they're not actually taking money from the government to, to have this wonderful hoax. You know, you probably have, if you ever watch the, uh, uh, the false news network, you know, you'll frequently be told that climate change, or you go on the blogs. It's all a hoax created by Obama's czars. Uh, and we've entrained about a millennium already of constant change in precipitation patterns, which means we've already brought on humanity a millennium of changing our infrastructure for handling, uh, for handling water, which is a non-trivial thing there. In other words, when you talk about fixing up U.S. infrastructure, we should be talking about fixing up the water handling infrastructure in the most flexible, resilient possible way. But what we see already is the possibility of starvation, death by starvation of even billions of people. For example, in Southeast Asia, uh, or South, uh, South and Southeast Asia, uh, the Himalayan water tower is melting, the glaciers and the ice of the Himalayas. That supplies the agricultural water to roughly 1.6 billion people. That's 1.6 billion people whose crops are already in trouble for various reasons from the Green Revolution uh, mistakes on up uh, through the fact that as it warms, uh, the productivity of both wheat and rice drops. And by the way, as a, as a society named Homo sapiens, but it's a bad name, we haven't been putting the money into the CIGIAR group that would at least fund the attempts to keep getting out new strains of crops that'll do better as it gets warmer. So you got 1.6 billion people who are going to be greatly reduced ag water and crops that have reduced produ production and they all have nuclear weapons now, right? And if you read the most recent articles by uh, Toon et al., you know that even a tiny nuclear war between India and Pakistan, a not unlikely event, will take us out too, basically. The world economy and much of the environment will go down the drain. So. Uh, when you're talking to people about climate change, the most critical thing to focus on, in my view, is changing precipitation patterns and what that's going to mean for agriculture. I should point in that tied into that, of course, is going to be the need to change our energy handling infrastructure uh, over the next probably 20 to 30 years if we're going to survive. That's going to be a gigantic expense. And what is the U.S. spending its money on now? trying to get fossil fuels out of Central Asia. We're, we're fighting in Afghanistan for the gas pipelines. We invaded, as they admitted, invaded Iraq to get the oil. Invading Iraq to get the oil is like a hungry man invading Iraq to get the cyanide. In other words, we already have more than enough pumpable petroleum to destroy our civilization. We're not about to run out of fossil fuels. Uh, depending on the economics, you might, it'll go on for a very long time. What we're running out of, of course, as hopefully you tell your classes, is environment, is some place to put the carbon dioxide, among other things, that comes out of the fossil fuels. So the climate change thing is extraordinarily serious. Why did I say it may not? You know, here we might lose two billion people or something from climate change quite easily. Uh, what the, I remember, more than a billion people are hungry today. You know, I, 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 I was, I'm so used to being attacked that it's almost as, as as Rob Emanuel said to a friend of mine when he was being attacked by these morons, it's a real honor. But when, when Norman Borlaug died, and I knew Norman, uh, the blogs were just covered with, Borlaug was the person who saved the planet and showed that Ehrlich was wrong, that population was a factor. And the thing that, they're, they're not even vaguely scholarly. All they had to do was look up Norman Borlaug. Uh, he belonged to a population organization. In his Nobel Prize speech, he said, I may have bought you a couple of decades to kill the population monster. There were many fewer people hungry when Borlaug got the Nobel Prize for his very good work. I mean, an incredible uh, guy. He did all the right things, even though there were some problems associated with him. There was no way around those problems at the time. But uh, the, uh, the people just don't even bother to check the numbers on such things. And it, it, one of the things that I've been on, I've done a lot of looking at the blogs lately, 
And every time I used to think the web might solve our problems, I just go to the blogs and work. Well, many of you are teachers. I don't know what to do. In other words, I, I Googled for another reason um, missing links about a year ago. The first 25 sites I got were creationist sites, very cleverly designed. In other words, when you're teaching kids, most of us here are old enough to have actually seen things that were refereed in scientific journals and so on and so forth. If you, if you said, I mean, there's a lot of bullshit there too, but if you send them to the web to find stuff, how do they sort it out? They don't have any filters in place. They might, for example, think that the environmental Kuznets curve tells us that we can keep getting richer and richer and grow out of this problem, as a couple of morons published not long ago. Uh, you know, the, the problem is that we have a totally ignorant public, and I don't know where the hell to send them most of the time. All right, as students, I mean, send students. I don't know where to send the public either. Anyway, so why did I say that climate change may not be the worst of the problems? Well, I don't know how many of you have been following the situation with toxics, but we have something like 100,000 or more synthetic compounds out there, now mostly distributed from pole to pole. A lot of them are, uh, are, are hormone mimics that have nonlinear dose response curves, which means that some of them uh, can make your situation much worse in smaller doses, smaller quantities, trace quantities, than in larger quantities, because it depends on how your cells upregulate or downregulate the receptors. Now, there are already some bad signs. Intersex alligators, frogs with six legs. In some subarctic villages, the sex ratio is now uh, three girl, two girl babies to every one male baby, uh, although the normal sex ratio is 105 males to 100 females. Uh, the polar bear's gonads are dropping off, on and on and on, lots of nasty signs. Okay, let's suppose that some of the synergisms among those compounds, uh, by the way, essentially, very, very few of them are tested one at a time for effects on human beings. Even fewer are tested one at a time for effects on ecosystems. As far as I know, no single synergism has been studied on a global basis. In other words, we know that lots of these chemicals synergize. I mean, like if you're a smoker uh, and you, you breathe asbestos, the synergism there is really grotesque. You're going to die uh, and fast. But the, uh, we haven't tested any of that stuff. Now, Let's suppose, as it certainly looks, we've had all this talk about climate change, all this attention, and with the exception of a small blip uh, from the depression, uh, the green, there's more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere every year than there was the year before. In other words, we're talking like crazy, but as far as I know, nowhere in the world is anything really significant being done about it. We're already well above what many climatologists think uh, is the minimal amount of CO2 we can afford to have in the atmosphere. If it gets away from us, we have a whole, you know, engineers have come up with a whole array of nutcase solutions. We're gonna put a sunscreen between us and the sun, which will reduce the, uh, the amount of energy uh, that reaches the surface of the earth. What, what that would do to agriculture, we're not sure. What it would do to a lot of things, we're not sure. But what you can be sure of is it's not gonna stop ocean acidification, but we can turn the oceans into Pepsi Cola and who cares, you know, what this minor thing, the oceans, or we're gonna have we're going to have the battleship Missouri fire at 16-inch guns every five minutes for the next 200,000 years, putting crap in the atmosphere to do the same thing. Or we're going to dump squadrillions of tons of iron to fertilize the southern oceans, except when they tried just a ton or two, it didn't go the way they expected it to. But these are possibilities. I mean, these are nutcase things. You've got to be really insane to try them when the problem could be solved with a stroke of a pen and a gasoline tax, uh, or a, I shouldn't say a gas tax, a carbon tax. Uh, but the question is, what do you do if everybody starts getting pancreatic cancer when they're eight? Are you going to be even able to identify the synergizing compounds? If you identify the synergizing compounds, what's going to be your nutcase strategy? Get every graduate student in the world out there with forceps, picking them out of the global environment? Seems unlikely. In other words, we, don't even, we haven't even thought about that problem or have any plans at all. The engineers haven't even faced it. So in that respect, climate change may not be. Uh, the most serious problem. And of course, there are other things tied in with climate change that ecologists are extremely worried about and some think may be worse, like land use change, particularly if we try and 
uh, do a lot more agriculture to support the more people, but more important to support our SUVs, because we all know that it's more important to grow plants, to make biofuels, so you can keep running SUVs than it is to feed people, because you know, who needs the people? So uh, land use change may be much worse. The epidemiological situation may be much worse, as again, where have you seen it pointed out that the more people you have, particularly the more immune compromised people you have, and we have a record size immune compromised population because people are undernourished or immune compromised, uh, and we have more than a billion now, uh, the greater the chances of novel diseases transferring from their mammalian hosts into our population. The larger the population, the greater chance it won't die out uh, because uh, it, really nasty diseases are sometimes self-limiting. If you have too small a population, everybody becomes dead or immune, and the disease is gone from the human population. But the bigger your population, the less chances of that. And then there's our wonderful rapid transport systems, which allowed one airline steward to infect four people with HIV on four different continents in a week. Uh, you know, in, 19, in 1810, if a plague ship left uh, Japan heading for India, nobody got plague in India because everybody was either immune or dead by the time the ship got there. That's not the way it is with 747s. So these are other problems that might be uh, much more severe than climate change. We just don't know yet, but at least the world has turned scientific because we're running the experiment. We're going to find out uh, which of these things finishes us off uh, as a society before the others. So, okay, so I've, I've outlined some of our problems, and uh, they're not really cheery because we're not doing anything. But I should say, there, I, maybe I did say already, there are a million do-gooder organizations trying to save the environment and get environmental justice uh, and get justice for people in general. And boy, we're not making much progress. Uh, so one of the things, by the way, that we're trying to do is create a, an overview organization that's going to try and, uh, and generate from the bottom up uh, some kind of solution to this problem. Uh, I want you to all write down, don't put in the www, all that crap that goes first, but just mahb, the mob, mahb.stanford.edu. And this is a result of a lot of conversations with a lot of czars and scientists, all of whom have exactly the same view. Uh, so something's really taking hold, and the view is this. We don't need any more studies of the intelligence of people with different skin colors. We don't need to test whether women are intrinsically smarter or dumber than men. We don't have to figure out whether it's a smart thing to keep burning fossil fuels till the environment goes down the drain. Science scholarship in general has shown us the directions that humanity ought to be moving, but we're not moving in those directions, at least not remotely fast enough uh, in most areas. And so instead of having more scientific studies, or I think we should have, we can use more scientific information, but the focus has got to shift onto human behavior. And the mob was originally suggested as a millennium assessment of human behavior. And the idea is to get the people of the world discussing what their vision of the future is, how they'd like to live, what is biophysically possible within that, and not have it a top-down thing which will lead to buy more Priuses, because there are, of course, powerful economic interests that want you to buy Priuses, but you can buy, if every car was converted tomorrow to a Prius, it wouldn't change the basic trajectory. Priuses do a lot beside, you know, they get a little better gas mileage. That's not going to save us from the automobile-dominated world. Uh, I, I sometimes shudder, a political scientist, and I wrote an article for the New York Times in 1972, uh, the title of which was, What If All the Chinese Have Wheels? And the amusing thing is, at that time, there were 500 million Chinese. Now there's 1.3 billion Chinese, and they're determinedly trying to get wheels. And even if they're all Priuses, guess what? You know, Their tires are still going to rub on the road surface. They're still going to be paving over ecosystems to let them drive. They're still going to have to be winning the metals from poorer and poorer soils to get them. There's a crucial point, of course, on the population issue, which I'll turn to briefly now, is the next two and a half billion people that are programmed into the planet are going to do immensely more damage to environmentally each one than the last two and a half million. You've probably never seen this discussed in the mass media, but think about it. Homo sapiens, we're a brilliant species. We became dominant on the planet. The paradox of dominance is we're not smart enough to keep from destroying it, but 
you know, the people didn't start originally farming the marginal land and then move towards the river bottoms. They didn't start mining copper at half a percent, uh, or that they do now. The copper was lying around on the surface 100%. Uh, they didn't have to pump water large distances and purify it. And so what you can see is each person you add has to, on average, have food that's gained by farming more marginal land, has to have water that's required more energy to transport and purify, has to get anything that you drill a well for from deeper wells, uh, has to uh, reuse its metals from uh, poorer metals and so on. So the environmental impact of each person gets worse and worse as the population enlarges. Uh, again. You don't have to be a rocket scientist to see the more people we have, the more greenhouse gases we have, everything else being equal. Although, if they took the Ehrlich plan, you would never hear another word about, about greenhouse gases and climate disruption. All we need is a global breath hold day. If nobody breathes for a full day, no CO2 from human beings will go into the atmosphere. And I guarantee you, if nobody breathes for a day, you'll never hear another word about it. Outside of that, it's the only truly uh, great suggestion I have in this area. So one of the drivers is population. In a sense, it's the least problematic of the big two. And that is, A, almost everybody who's numerate knows we have a population problem. In other words, those who are convincible are convinced. Uh, the, the, the Republicans and half the Democrats and so on, the ones with the IQs that are room temperature Celsius, uh, are never going to be convinced. There's no point. But since the population bomb was written, the social scientists have done a really good job. We now know a lot about uh, fertility decisions. Uh, and we know, for example, that one of the best ways to get total fertility rates down is to give women jobs, education. Around the world, women still are behind uh, in uh, uh, literacy rates. And by the way, this is in even in the US, but also in, in Places you think of where the role, where women have real opportunity, China, uh, Sweden, uh -uh, they're all behind. Uh, there's a glass ceiling in the countries and so on. But we do know that if you can give women a break, their fertility rates go down. It will require more than that. You're not really the problem. Don't worry about it back there. <laughs> have, have, have all of you seen the best ad in Europe? Uh, it was, it's all over YouTube. It's a, it's a, I got to tell you about it. It's a scene in which a guy goes into a supermarket with, a, with a, about a seven-year-old boy. And the seven-year-old boy points to something he wants. And the father says, no. And so the kid throws a fit, and <laughs> lying on the floor, screaming, knocking over cans, running around, bashing, and then going back to the floor, shaking his fist, screaming. And then the ad comes on. It's for condoms. Uh, so <laughs> it got the prize as the best ad in Europe last year. Look it up, look it up on YouTube. The bigger problem, I mean, and population size has been going in the right direction in many places. That is, fertility rates have been coming down. There's a lot of BS out there about how you could solve the whole problem by giving everybody condoms. You certainly could do a lot by making access to contraceptives better around the world. Some people think it would solve about 30% of the growth problems. You still got the other 70% to go. But at least things have been going in the right direction. Now, you may have noticed that the population issue has come back uh, above the surface quite a bit recently. Uh, but there's been a big pushback. And a lot of articles saying, well, the problem is consumption, not population. Well, actually, a huge part of the problem is consumption. Uh, but what they miss is you can no more sort out the, the control, whether it's population or consumption, than you can sort out whether the width or the length of a rectangle is more responsible for the area. And the point that they miss almost always is, don't try and give people in poor countries an opportunity to control their reproduction, because they're not going to consume so much. They're just going to be the victims of our consumption. But I haven't seen one article in that tone, you know, it's just consumption, which points out that the very best thing you could do is shrink the populations of the most overpopulated nations the most overpopulated we're sitting right now because, of course, overpopulation just isn't how many people you have. It's how much those people consume on average. And when you have, we have 304 million people in the United States today. No one has even suggested a semi-sane reason for having more than 120 million 
people. But the mass media thought, boy, what an accomplishment we got. 300 million, remember we went through 300 million? Everybody just got so excited, it was so wonderful and so on. I always remember what I think Garrett Hardin said, that nice, if we ever need more people, they can be produced by unskilled labor that enjoys its work. I wouldn't <laughs> worry about it. Uh, anyway, uh, the consumption problem is considerably more difficult uh, than, the, uh, uh, than the population problem to deal with. First of all, uh, there is no technical literature on how to handle consumption. With some, I'm working with some economists on this. We published a few things. Uh, and I mean economists like Ken Arrow, uh, non-trivial economists. But it's a really difficult issue technically because, first of all, uh, the overconsumption is concentrated among the rich. There are large numbers of people who underconsume. The billion people who are hungry could do a lot more as human beings to help with the environment if they had a decent meal. They should be consuming more. But the issues of how you control consumption how you even do the evaluation. For example, is there anybody here happen to have $30 million on just at the moment? Nobody? Oh, God. Well, I won't be able to raise money for the mob that way. But uh, if you had the choice of buying an executive jet or a Van Gogh, the environmentally sound decision is fairly obvious. But what if you're going to buy a computer? How do you find out which is the environmentally sound one to buy? Or is it better to buy an abacus? You know, you're, it's a, you, you can't do a life history analysis on every single item you do. It's like trying to decide whether to eat shrimp in a restaurant or not. We all know that some shrimp are sustainably harvested and many shrimp are very environmentally disruptive. Have any of you ever tried to find out from a restaurant where they get the shrimp? They get it from the jobber. That's what you're told. You never can get the answer. So there's a big informational problem of what to do and you're going to cut consumption. Maybe worse is the idea that the average, the average politician, almost every last one of them, thinks increasing consumption is the answer to all economic problems, as you may have seen recently. Uh, and that's nuts. We can't keep increasing consumption any more than we can keep increasing population. But nobody's come up with a consumption condom. Nobody's got a consumption at morning after pill. My, my colleague, the best, one of the best public health people in the world, K uh, Kirk Smith, did come up with a good idea. He says the government ought to have vans that if you had a shopping spree one day, they drive around the next morning and grab the stuff back and take it back to the car. So it's sort of a morning after consumption spree pill. Uh, but it's a really difficult technical problem, particularly when the average, the average person in our society thinks that growth, the growth mania is in there just full scale. The fact that it's a very recent phenomenon, that in fact uh, economic growth at anything like the rates we've seen is just a matter of the last hundred years or so. In other words, for most of human history, we weren't growing economically. And for most of human history, if there is one in the future, we're not going to be growing economically. It's just mathematics. Uh, but trying to deal with the consumption problem is going to be even more difficult, in my view, than dealing with the population problem. Because among other things, what I'm sure is obvious to all of you, is even 6.8 billion people can't live in the style that those of us in this room are living. You can't do it. You need more Earths. So it implies immediately when you're faced with continuing gro more growth that besides having to reduce consumption, we're going to have to redistribute wealth in some form. And as you may recall, uh, d during, during the election, I thought the most pathetic thing was the Republicans accusing Obama of being a redistributionist. As far as I can see, actually, he's bought into the Republican program of redistribution, which is taking money away from the poor and giving it to the rich. I mean, we, can you imagine? We actually are trying to return hundreds of millions of dollars to the crooks on Wall Street who screwed up the whole financial system in order to keep them in the country. I say, you know, send them to China or someplace. Let them screw up their system, not ours. But, uh, you know, these are people who serve no function in society except to enrich themselves. It, you do need financial operations in a society, but there is no function that's useful, no social function, in putting together bags of dodgy debt and selling them to people who are ignorant. I mean, it just doesn't work. And yet we are allowing them to go on spending money that, I mean, that the, the bonuses of the people on Wall Street this year would permanently cure four or five of the worst human diseases, like leprosy and so on. I, I, we got rid of, I think it cost about 200, I may have the number, numbers wrong, about 200 million to uh, get rid of smallpox. And that's what? One person's, uh, one person's fees as a head of a, of a uh, HMO uh, supplying us with health. 
I mean, I know the most depressing thing, to get slightly off topic, but I think it, what's depressed me more than anything else has been the so-called debate on health care in this country. It shows the depth of the ignorance of our people is almost beyond belief. The, uh, I mean, everybody knows that health is a governmental function. And to turn that function over to corporations whose main goal will be to see you die as fast as possible, who hire people to write policies to make sure you can't get treated, and then that people marching around saying, don't take away my Medicare, I don't want the government to interfere in Medicare, you know, what hope is there? Anyway, so <laughs> consumption, I'm not, I'm not even going to talk a lot about the, the, the T factor in the iPad equation, except to say we have paid more attention to that, at least in terms of, uh, yeah, we ought to have more efficient appliances, yeah, we ought to have better mileage in our cars and so on. But again, uh, the people who think there's going to be a technological cure to this just don't know the history. You read over the last 40 years, when I, when, when I wrote the population bomb, I got lots of letters saying, look, we're going to feed everybody, we're going to grow algae on sewage. And the people who were always recommending that weren't going to be the sewage algae eaters, they were going to be the growers, the rest of us were going to get the eater. We were going to farm whales and atolls. We were going to have nuclear agro-industrial complexes and so on. And I had the same answer for when we had 3.5 million as I have today, when we're almost at seven. And that is, why don't we see if we can give every one of the human beings on the planet now a decent life before we start blabbering on about how the carrying capacity is 20 billion or 30 billion or whatever number the idiots come up with. I, somebody was telling, oh, Bill Ryerson was telling me that he was on a, uh, on a right-wing talk show and after he went off, the, the host assured, assured everybody that the carrying capacity of the planet was 100 billion people, which is, you know, a lot of people. Or there, there once was a mail order marketer named Julian Simon who got a lot of publicity from the right wing because he said that uh, human beings have enough knowledge in their brains and in their, uh, and in their uh, libraries to keep the population growing. Does anybody remember for how long? It's a, the clo no, just seven billion years. <laughs> John Holdren, who's now the science advisor of Obama, said, I thought it was six billion. Uh, it's a wonderful classroom exercise. Just have your students start with a 1% growth rate. The time he said it, the growth rate was two and a half, or even one half of 1%, or even a thousandth of 1%, and see where you get in seven billion years. But of course, he's the darling of the Rush Limbaugh's, who you know, have to take off their shoes to count up to 20 and probably miss the number. Uh, actually, I think he's polydactylous anyway. Uh, so. We, we're facing uh, a, uh, a rather difficult task, all of us, uh, but I think that there are basically about six things that we have to get people to do, besides join the mob, mahb.stanford.edu, because the plan is not to have just top-down. It's to get the social scientists, the humanitarians, and the natural scientists talking to everybody and with everybody and listening to what for instance, we're going to, we're founding a group in Arizona, and I've been told, was talking to one of the Native American leaders. You have situations where there are very different visions of the world and so on. How do we reconcile them? How do we get people talking about this? So uh, I'm a great fan of the mob, even if it doesn't work. It's a Hail Mary pass. But besides that, what are the things we got to do? First of all, uh, we always have to point out that having intervened artificially in the death rate it's morally incumbent on us to find some way humanely to intervene in the birth rate so that we begin get to the point where we begin to get a slow decline towards some kind of sustainable population. We know for sure that we're not sustainable today. The reason is very simple. We're using up our natural capital. We're not living on the income from it. We're using up our capital, and you can't go on forever using up your capital. So that's an absolutely crucial thing. Uh, and. I, don't th I think it's feasible uh, to get it done. It's happened in much of Europe. Uh, we're slowly getting a decline there. Unfortunately, the governments are still trying to encourage population growth because they don't like the idea that the age structure is going to change. But as you all know, that's just arithmetic. You cannot slow a population's growth <laughs> without the age structure changing. And they're a little bit nuts on that, too because basically the dependency ratio is usually calculated, as you will recall, as those between uh, 15 and 65 supporting those under 15 and those over 65. And it's true 
uh, that if you, uh, if you slow population growth and halt it, you'll get a proportionally more people over 65. But of course, you get proportionally fewer people under 15. And I'm told that a 70-year-old is more likely to be economically productive than a 7-year-old. You also, you also lose a big chunk of the terrorist and criminal age classes as the age structure shifts. I've also been told it's possible for people to remain productive after they're 65. Uh, but of course, the fundamental flaw in this, I mean, there's been a storm of articles about the birth dearth and how we're all going to, you know, the social security is going to go down the drain and on and on and on and on. Uh, but of course, the only alternative is to have the population grow forever. And of course, most of the politicians think that's possible, and so they just go right ahead uh, encouraging the growth. But what we're actually doing when we don't is put, pass on the problems of age structure uh, for our children or grandchildren to solve in a period when we'll have many fewer resources, many more wars, resource wars, and so on. I didn't even get into the, the nuclear war stuff, but that could solve our population problem. So, first thing we got to do, and make sure all, by the way, I do not like most of the environmental science textbooks, although I haven't read them all, but generally they tend to be too flat. In other words, recycling will be given the same emphasis as controlling the size of the population. Or controlling the size of the population, they'll say, well, uh, Peter Raven or Paul Ehrlich or Tom Lovejoy says we got too many people, but Julian Simon says we can grow for another seven billion years, so you know, you gotta make your choice. Uh, one of the key things when you're teaching this stuff is you got to talk about the main drivers and the main effects. Yeah, it's important to have people recycle because it gets them involved, but as you know, if we recycled absolutely everything and continued on the course we're on now, it would, you know, the world would end about 17 hours later. So you can buy 17 hours if you recycle everything, but don't let that bullshit uh, you know, affect what you actually teach if you can avoid it. So first thing is uh, to see to it that we move towards a shrinking population as rapidly and humanely as possible, not rapidly as possible to the point where you really screw up the age structure so badly you may create more problems than you solve, but we should be moving in that direction. And the most important place to move in that direction is the rich countries, because we're the ones that are screwing up the world. Uh, the people in sub-Saharan Africa do all kinds of environmental damage, but nothing compared to the people like me. Uh, second thing is the consumption issue, uh, and there, we somehow have to change the whole culture. That is the idea that the person who wins has the most gadgets has got to go. We've got to put conservation way ahead of consumption. And I think the important thing to do uh, is to get the discussion going because much of the consumption is generated by advertising. There's some very good sociological studies of this and it's to make it competitive consumption. One thing we've been doing, uh, our, the mob group has been meeting in Second Life and I don't know how many of you are familiar with Second Life, but there's more than a billion dollars worth of US dollar transactions on an annually, millions of people are involved, and I just wonder if we couldn't temporarily at least move a lot of the competitive, competitive consumption onto Second Life, where you can buy an island, vegetate it, hire an architect that builds you a 25,000 square foot dot-com palace, stuff the garage with Bugattis, uh, stuff the, as I have done, I've got a, a bottle of 45 Mouton Virtual, which I drink during all meetings, uh, I never get a hangover. Uh, it, it only numbs it a little bit. But the point is, you, you can, uh, I'm trying to find out from, uh, from uh, the outfit that runs it what the ratio would be of doing it on Second Life where you're involved with uh, basically server time as opposed to the energy cost of actually doing it. So if people could learn to compete, their, get rid of their competitive consumption ideas in Second Life, it might be a huge benefit. Anyway, the consumption problem has got to, it's got to be tackled both by activists, but also that's a place where the social sciences, the environmental sciences, and the humanities should be able to get together. It, it needs technical understanding of what to do too. By the way, we're trying to involve people in the humanities, and a lot of people say, what the hell can anybody in the humanities have to say about our present dilemma? Well, the answer is plenty. The two examples I like to give is photography, where the whole environmental attitude changed with one picture. Those of you who are old enough remember when it was first published, the picture of Earth from the moon made a gigantic difference. Or if you want to go back a little bit in time, when Abraham Lincoln met Harriet Beecher Stowe, who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin, she said, ah, oh, 
you're the little woman who started this big war. In other words, we underrate what can be done in the humanities, in philosophy, in ethics, and so on, on all of these issues, and we got to drag the humanitarian, the hum humanists in uh, as well. But the consumption area is one where they can really come in. Then, uh, the, in the terms of the toxics and so on, uh, we're not doing any and nearly enough cost-benefit analysis on the stuff we release into the environment. Uh, I say 100,000 or more synthetic chemicals already out there. Some of them do very good things. If you develop a new compound, uh, then it is really in, uh, necessary for society in some form to make a decision. The, if the new compound has a, an excellent chance of curing breast cancer, then you might want to take uh, even a, a lar fairly large chance that it'll make trouble if you release it into the environment. If it's something that makes eyelash glue a little stronger, then you might not want to release it. In other words, we don't do that kind of benefit cost analysis rit ritually on the crap we put into the environment. We've got to find a way to do it, but that's again, not simple. In other words, one of the problems with a lot of our environmental uh, problems is it requires too many people to monitor. For instance, you're talking about monitoring water quality, in my view, you get an awful lot of that out of the way by simply requiring that any entity that takes water from a, uh, a stream or lake and returns waste to it have its waste uh, disposal thing upstream of the intake. That would solve the problem where you wouldn't have to do very much testing at all, right? You wouldn't see those signs in the upper Mississippi saying flush the toilet, the people in New Orleans need the water, that sort of thing. So there are ways of dealing with that. Anyway, so we got to deal with these consumption patterns and we got to uh, actually do more cost benefit analysis and one of the big challenges is how to figure out how to do it without it, the cost of the monitoring being too high. Uh, then one of the things we've got to do is, in my view, spread our empathy. This is something that I think is entirely possible. Uh, if you look at history, empathy in human beings, we're a small group animal, empathy has spread already very widely. For example, 150 years ago in Madison, if your horse stumbled, you could get a two by four and beat it to death. It was your property. In, in Alabama, if your slave stumbled, you could do the same thing. Now, if you want to run an experiment tomorrow, why don't you take a horse out of Madison and try and beat it to death with a two by four and see what happens. Empathy has spread. Uh, a lot of us were happy that Saddam Hussein disappeared even though we totally disapproved of the war because we didn't like what he did to his people. 200 years ago, nobody gave a damn what some dictator in some far part of the world so, I mean, we are getting more empathetic. Sadly, we've kind of stopped temporarily, and again, in terms of historical time, we're moving rapidly, with people who think the nation state is the ultimate state of humanity, and this is where we're going to stop. If you know your history, of course, the nation state's only a couple hundred years old in its present form, really less than that, uh, and it's crystal clear that we've got to find some kind of international regime to try and solve the problems that we're facing. None of them can be solved within uh, a nation. So. But that's, oh, you want world government. You're going to give up your sovereignty. You won't, my, my God, George Bush might not have been able to invade Iraq, invade Iraq to get its oil, you know? I mean, that's a sort of terrible thing that could happen if you gave up some of your sovereignty. So that's going to be a big issue, and I'm not sure how we're going to solve it. Uh, Semi-finally, uh, maybe almost finally, uh, we've got to work, and particularly people like us, in trying to get people to talk about their vision of the world and to develop one that will be appealing to most people. That is, uh, one of the problems with being an environmental scientist is you see all this destructive crap going on around you. You see these morons uh, you know, on Fox News or the Washington Times or someplace or go into any of the blogs. It's very depressing and you keep saying, that's wrong, that's wrong, you gotta stop doing this, we gotta stop doing that. But we don't do anywhere near enough of saying, if you stop doing that, we can have a different kind of world. For instance, the United States, I think, to give you just an example of one of my visions, the last 75 years have been at the behest of the oil, automobile, and tire companies transformed the United States into a nation of, for automobiles, not for people. The main goal is to make it a car-driven society because people make a lot of money on that. Uh, I think you know we should be looking towards redesigning the country around people. I'm not saying get rid of all the automobiles. You can take out the engines and gas tanks and spot them around places because they're wonderful places for teenagers to make love, right? I mean, uh, so. Yeah, they do have a function. It's just not moving people around all the time. Uh, and, you know, why don't we get ourselves a four or three day work week so there's more employment around 
and people could learn to make love the rest of the time or get drunk or whatever they want to do, snort lines. I don't care. The point is that the U.S., more than any other country, works harder, and what do we get for it? George W. Bush. I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. So, basically, I, I, I'm, I'm sounding very Pollyannish, but there's one thing, <laughs> I hate to, there's one thing that I say to every audience, and that is if you look historically, for reasons we don't sometimes partially understand and sometimes don't understand at all, society can change very, very rapidly on very fundamental issues. Uh, all the way from, in just a few decades, getting rid of cigarettes, which is not a fundamental issue, but was, if you were ever like me, a smoker, it was getting rid of a horrendous addiction. But uh, when I was a kid, if you were a woman, your choices of occupation were pretty much limited to grammar school teacher, nurse, secretary, there's one other, I can't, uh, anyway, doesn't matter, very, very limited. If you had a really dark skin, you weren't going to show up on a TV show, on a radio show, you weren't in entertainment, you couldn't play baseball, because there was a lot of doubt about whether people with dark skins could actually hit a ball until Jackie Robinson broke in uh, with the uh, Brooklyn Dodgers. But in a matter of a decade or so, particularly because of the Second World War, those things changed very, very rapidly. Uh, and the, the example that many of you lived through, that not one of my politically sophisticated friends <coughs> ever claimed to have foreseen was the coming down of the Berlin Wall and the end of, uh, of the Soviet Union. So when the time is ripe, things can change very, very rapidly. The challenge for all of us, and particularly all of us, is to find ways to ripen the time. Thank you very much. I was I was hoping that with a friendly audience and all that we could we could have Paul somehow overcome his reticence to speak frankly and tell us what he really thinks about the world. But maybe there's time for just two or three questions from the audience, because I don't want to short circuit the chance for you to talk personally to Paul in getting a copy of his book signed right outside the lobby. All royalties go to the mob, so I'm not making any money on it. So let's just take two or three quick questions. I'll try and I see a gentleman over here. Hey, I, yeah, I'll, I'll, re I'll repeat the question. Could I talk a little bit more about the mob, how it developed and where it's going? Well, it originally developed, uh, Ann and I suggested it in One with Nineveh, a book we published about five years ago. And Don Kennedy, who was then uh, the editor of Science, was very interested in it. And Don and I wrote an editorial about it. As a matter of fact, the October 7th issue has a little statement about it. What we did was we organized, I'll go into more detail for this group than I would for most. We organized a sort of practice mob at Stanford. One of the problems we saw was that a lot of the social scientists who came just wanted basically to find ways to get more money to do the same research they were doing. It's exactly the same thing, by the way, that ecologists were doing. There's nothing, nothing different about social scientists and natural scientists in that regard. But we had some really wonderful discussions. And then Walt Reed was running it for us, and he got another job, and we ran out of money and it sort of faded away, but a bunch of social scientists had gotten gradually interested, and we, I've been working with them for uh, a couple of years, and particularly people in, in Scandinavia where the Norwegian and Swedish governments are very interested in this whole behavioral issue, and I was publishing stuff in Cultural Evolution because that's where I'm putting all of my research. I want to understand how societies change if it's possible. And so gradually, uh, we decided to put together a website and start involving people. And I, uh, uh, I sent an email around about a month ago now to maybe 50 to 100 of my colleagues announcing, just announcing that the website was there and to go look at it and see if they'd like to get involved. And it's spread so that now 10 or 20,000 people at least 
have looked at it, uh, and people are know about it, and people are coming and starting to organize mob discussion. It's one of these things where I'm elated and exhausted for the same reason. We really just wanted to continue the gradual development of this because the hope was to get enough money to have an UNCTAD type conference in 2011 or 2012, you know, basically asking the behavioral questions, a conference about what are people for, what do we want, what are we trying to get, is it biophysically possible and how many and so on. So the mob today is something that you can really contribute to with ideas. You go to the website, sign up, get yourself an avatar if you want to come to, we have Monday morning meetings with people with people's avatars on Second Life, but uh, as I say, Tom Sisk is trying to organize a mob to discuss all the problems of the of northern, basically all of Arizona, where you have these very conflicting interests, say, of the developers in, in uh, uh, Tucson versus the Native American groups that are very much concerned with various policies having to do with access to the, cana uh, to the uh, canyon and so on and so forth, just to start the discussion. So the basic thing is if it's going to be ground up, and I have no idea where it's going to go or whether it'll really be successful, but I have not seen any other, you know, any other suggestion for how we get the people of the world talking about this. And we have the Australians are starting to get interested in it. We are hoping uh, I'm going to be talking to a bunch of people in Colombia about it in February. Uh, so we're trying to make it into something global. It won't work unless people are willing to put some time in, contribute, and I don't just mean contribute.